I like lecture 15. Uh, I think hierarchical, hierarchical models are neat. So we've been dealing with two random variables at a time. And we've looked at things like joint densities, which in the, if they're independent, you can multiply them together. So in, in some sense, I think of those uh, random variables as like on the same level, where here we're going to have two sources of randomness, but they're going to be kind of stacked vertically rather than being combined in a horizontal manner. And uh, well, if that doesn't make sense, let's just get into, into an example. We'll define a random variable to have a mixture distribution if its distribution depends on a, another random quantity, if it depends on something that also has a distribution. So x itself, it's a random variable. It's obviously random. But something about its distribution depends on something else that's random. So two levels of randomness. X is random, and it depends on something that is random as well. So let's go straight to an example. We've got a cheating gambler who produces their own unfair dice uh, where they have a greater than one six chance of rolling a six. So it's biased in favor of, of six. But there's very variation in the process of making these cheating dice. So the actual probability of a six varies from die to die. Let's say the distribution of probabilities for rolling a six is uniform from one fourth to one third. All right, so for a die selected at random, let x denote the number of rolls until a six is observed. So there's two sources of randomness. First, you're going to pick a die, and they're all a little bit different, and so the probability that it comes up six changes from die to die. But once you have that, then you roll it until you see a six and you count the number of trials that takes. All right, you see the two sources of randomness contributing to this. Uh, we're going to try to find the distribution of x. And actually, we're gonna, as we do it, we'll solve not just for one, one fourth, one third, but for just a general a to b uniform. So as you read that, uh, there should be two different distributions that jump out to you. What are those? Well, one's a uniform, right? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a uniform. That part's uh, kind of obvious. Yeah. So if we're thinking about the probability of seeing a 6, let's represent that by p. And normally, we'd use a lowercase p for that. But this time, the chance of rolling a 6, the probability is itself a random variable. So I'm going to call it uh, capital P. And capital P is distributed uniform from A to B. All right, now, uh, how about this random number x? Is a distribution that should come to mind when you read its description. Sounds like a geometric. It does sound like a geometric. And it's really tempting to say that x is geometric. But we can't say that. We're going to find out it's, it's close but not quite geometric. But if, if we conditioned on picking out a certain die and knowing the chance that that die comes up 6, and if we could treat that as fixed, then it would be geometric. So x is not geometric, but it is conditionally geometric. So I'm going to write that two different ways, and, and both are common. I can say that x is distributed geometric, but not with a lowercase fixed constant p, but with a random variable p. And this p is the same random variable p that's uniform. Or another way I could write this is... Uh, Conditionally, x given that p is equal to little p is distributed geometric little p. Okay, you agree with that? All right. Um, so let's think about the joint distribution of, of p and x. And let's note, this is something new that we haven't seen. This is neither purely discrete nor, nor continuous. This is going to be a, kind, of a, kind of a hybrid. <clears throat> I 
So um, if P and X were both discrete, then I would think about like points in space, and it would take on you know, uh, values as ordered pairs, and I'd have like mass distributed at discrete points. If they were each continuous, then I would think of having like some density, some kind of surface over this. But it looks like uh, P is continuous, uniform A to B, while X is discrete. So P is distributed from A to B. Um, X is distributed on integers, positive integers. And so for each value of X, I actually get a, you know, some sort of distribution. I'm just going to like sketch a shape. If you can imagine, you know, looking at this sideways and just looking along any X, I see this density for P, which is probably going to change for different values of X. And then if I look at it the other way, if I fix a value of P, then I'm going to see something discrete as I look along the different values of X. So it's different, very different. A little, a little tricky to think about at first. So anyway, our goal is to find uh, the distribution of X. Since the X portion is discrete, I'd like to find the mass function of X. So far, when we've been working with uh, two or, we've only worked more with two at the most, if we're working with two random variables, what's the strategy for finding the distribution of one of them? You get the marginal by taking the joint and either integrating or summing over the variable you don't want. So uh, we don't actually have an expression for the joint yet. We're going to find a way to get that in a minute. So I'm just representing it here generically at first. I need to get rid of the P part. Since the P part is continuous, I'll need to integrate over that. So if I can integrate the bounds uh, over P for a fixed value of X, that'll give me the probability random variable X is little x. All right, I don't know the joint density, or I can't even call it a density. I don't know the joint distribution of these things. But, um, well, remember this. Maybe just off on the side. Just a rearrangement of the conditional probability definition. And you remember, we had a version for this for random variables, right? See, I got a little sloppy with my notation by not actually putting arguments there. It gets the point across. The joint is the product of a conditional uh, times a marginal, where the marginal is the one you're conditioning on. So I'm going to do that here. And so I do know x given p. So let's look at the conditional distribution of x uh, given p. and then multiplied that by the marginal of P, which I do know. And most of the time, that's our trick when we've got a hierarchical model. If we can figure out the distribution of kind of the first source of randomness, and then the conditional distribution of the second source, given the first, then their joint can be found by this product. All right, so that's, that's the general strategy. Keep that in mind. Now we can start uh, doing specific calculations with this. Uh, X given P is geometric. So let's see. Uh, here to take on the value X, I need X minus 1 failures. So the probability of failure is 1 minus P. I need X minus 1 of those to begin with. And then the last one needs to be a success. Then, uh, well, the density for a uniform is just 1 over the length of the interval. <clears throat> and 
And so I need to uh, integrate this with respect to P. I can, I can obviously pull out the 1 over B minus A. I didn't see how to do this immediately, uh, and I wasn't inter interested in figuring it out. I just used a table of integrals, looked in the back of Stewart's calculus or whatever the text is. Uh, and yeah, I found this form. And it is It's this. And it probably would have taken me a very long time to come up with that myself. But once I had that, I did just check it by taking the derivative of that, working backwards and verified. And sure enough, it works. Uh, so then, I just evaluate this at uh, B and A for, for P. Now, this is an example I made up. Sometimes you get nice answers out of this. Sometimes you just invent a distribution. Sometimes you come up with something that, you know, surely somebody's seen this at some point in history, uh, but it wasn't important enough to give it a name. It doesn't have a Wikipedia page. And maybe it's in some ancient, musty text. Who knows? It's new to me. Probably new to you as well. Okay, so yeah, medium simple complexity, uh, but I wanted to investigate it. What is, what's the behavior of this random variable like? So once you have that written, I'll move over to a spreadsheet. All right, so let's go to the browser. Yeah, so um, I, I took that mass function. First, I just put in a couple cells where I could put in an A and B. And then I've got different values of X. And I, up here, maybe you can tell that that is the mass function we just wrote down. So I'm getting the probabilities all the way down here. And I look at this, and uh, that looks like a geometric, right? X is conditionally geometric. Marginally, it's something that's almost geometric. It's just a little bit off. I wondered, was there some way to simplify? Uh, could this actually be a, a geometric, and I just haven't seen it yet? So I wondered, it kind of feels like maybe this is geometric where the chance of success is the average of the chance of success from the uniform. So I thought, is that it? Well, I did some checks, and um, not quite. So cells E or columns E and G look at the new random variable that we just came up with. H and I look at an actual geometric that would use the average uh, probability. And so one, thing's I, I, one thing I did to do a check is I look at the expected value. Oh, and they're close, but they're not quite right. They're just a little bit off. So we've invented some kind of distribution which is not that different from a geometric, but isn't quite geometric. Uh, we will come back to this in a little bit and make one more observation here. Okay, so you're thinking, uh, we know that if we could fix a value of P, P yeah, let's try that. Let's try going to... Um, Let's make these both really close to 0.5. Let's go from 0.5 to 0.51. Then the average of this thing, expected value is here, the average of that geometric. Yeah, it looks... Yeah. I think it's... Uh, surely it must be converging to a geometric. I believe that. All right, so uh, kind of neat. This was a made-up problem. Uh, let's go to some others where we will see something nice at the end.
All right, uh, an insect lays a large number of eggs. We'll model that with a Poisson lambda distribution. We'll assume lambda is kind of large, you know, it's laying hundreds of thousands of eggs. An egg will hatch and the larva will survive into adulthood with probability P. So, you know, some of the eggs are duds, some of them get eaten by frogs and other things. Uh, so there's only a probability P that they actually survive and potentially make offspring of their own. Find the distribution of X, the number of adult offspring. So again, we're going to look for uh, two random variables, two sources of randomness, and one's going to be marginal, one's going to be something known conditioned on the other. Can you help me set it up? I agree with that, yeah. Let's let the number of eggs be capital N. And this part's pretty direct. N is Poisson lambda. And then X, the number that actually uh, survive into adulthood. It's not marginally binomial, but we can think of it as a binomial with a random parameter, a random number of trials. Or, using the other way of expressing this, conditionally, if we could fix the value of n, then we would have x being binomial. Okay, well, um, let's work with this one. We want the distribution of x. So I want the probability x is equal to x. Uh, in this case, both of these are discrete. So I'm just dealing with mass functions this time. So when I sum over the other variable, well, the other one's Poisson, which is also discrete. So I'll do a sum. And let's see. Since it's our, our, only our second example, let me go ahead and write out the setup and not skip any steps. Just in general, sum over the mass function, sum over the other variable. Uh, and then I'll re-express the joint as a product of something conditional times the mass for what you're conditioning on. So in exam two, Jed, I don't think you, maybe, I don't know if you thought of it that way, but you were, you were doing this in the um, trash, trash can papers problem. You're, you're setting it up as a hierarchical model. Yeah, when you started going over this, that's what I was thinking, like the second one depends on the first one. Yeah. Um, okay, I think I can start plugging in specifics into this. Now the trickiest thing about these jointly Distributed random variable is always the support. Is there some relationship between n and x? Does one of these have to be smaller than the other one? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't have more survive into adulthood than the number of eggs that are laid. So I can say uh, 0 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to n, less than or equal to infinity, where these are understood to be integer not continuous. Uh, so that means this conditional probability is going to be zero until n gets to x. So if, if n is smaller than x, uh, conditional probability is zero. So I'm just not going to include those in my sum at all. Okay, and then I write uh, the conditional distribution of x, which is binomial. So n choose x, p to the x, 1 minus p to the n minus x. Uh, and then n is Poisson. So I put the Poisson mass.
All right, and I just got to hope that I can simplify this thing down. So uh, it will. Let's start doing that. Uh, let's see, my sum, I'm summing values of n. So if something doesn't depend on n, I can pull it out. I can pull out a p to the x. I can pull out an e to the negative lambda. I'll leave everything else in. I know a binomial coefficient is really just factorials. And I've got this other factorial. Maybe I can uh, cancel something out. Let's see, what do I still have left in here? Still got to do the 1 minus p to the n minus x. Uh, still need the lambda to the n and the n factorial. Okay, well, the uh, n factorial, n factorial cancel out. All right, and so then something that isn't so obvious, I'm going to multiply by 1 in the form lambda to the x over lambda to the x. All right, so I've got this e to the negative lambda that stays on the outside. The p to the x and then the, in the numerator, the lambda to the x that were introduced, I can pull that lambda to the x out, combine it with the p, and I've got lambda p to the x. And then this x factorial that was left here, I can pull that out of the sum too. In a minute, I'm going to do a change of variables, but not yet. For now, let me just see what I have inside. Oh, yeah. This lambda x in the denominator, when I combine that with a lambda to the n, that's lambda to the n minus x. So I can combine that with 1 minus p to the n minus x. And then all that's left in the denominator is a n minus x factorial. All right, this is ripe for a change of variables. Can you see what a good change of variables would be? Yeah, yeah, let's just pick any uh, any variable, let's use t. Yeah, we see the n minus x shows up here, the n minus x shows up here. And another thing is, I very rarely like sums that start at something other than 0 or 1. So n equal to x is the same as n minus x equal to 0. This will let me then start a sum at t equal to 0. All right, so just carry along the stuff on the outside. And now this will be a sum from t going 0 to infinity. Oh, I'm starting to get crooked. Better straighten that out. Um, do you recognize this? You're looking a little like Paul Collins, but not quite. Yeah, if we had the e to the negative, yeah. uh, so we, we can do one of two things. We could either multiply by 1 in that form, e to the negative lambda, uh, 1 minus p, top and bottom, pull out one of them, leave the other one in here, in that case, it would be a Poisson mass, and the whole thing would just be 1. The other way to see it is uh, this is the Taylor series expansion of e to the lambda 1 minus p. And th those are equivalent ways of doing it. You get the same result either way. So if this is e to the lambda 1 minus p, if I combine that with this, Let's see, then the e to the negative lambda will cancel with the 
e to the lambda here. And I just get the e to the, yeah, negative lambda p. Yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want. Oh, this is nice. And what do we have here? Yeah, x is Poisson lambda p. So this is uh, something that you'll see in stochastics uh, again very soon. This is the phenomenon of Poisson thinning. If you have a Poisson process, but the things in the process only survive with probability p, that's equivalent to another Poisson process. Uh, it just scales your rate parameter down. Um, when we did generating functions in lecture four, remember the problem where the guy was taking pizza orders, but he was drunk, and so there was a Poisson number of orders, but he would only correctly uh, record it with probability p? Mm -hmm. It's the same result. Uh, now, here we're doing it with a hierarchical model. There we did it with generating functions, and you get the same result either way. All right, uh, questions or comments there? All right, so now we've got a general strategy using a conditioning argument to find the distribution of something that has multiple levels of randomness to it. What if you're only concerned with summaries? What if we just wanted the expected value or the variance? Then we've got two shortcut formulas here. Let's state them and prove them. If x and y are any two random variables, then the expected value of x can be found by iterating expectation, by doing two expectations. But what I'm taking the expectation of twice is conditional distribution of x given y. All right, now I'll admit, what, what's about to come next on the next page and a half, it's hard to think about. It makes my head spin a little bit. Uh, so let's be careful with this. If you can ignore the outer expectation and you just look at this part here, what this expectation is doing, it's averaging over x, but y is still random. So while you normally think of an expected value as being a constant, the expected value of a conditional distribution is still random. And it's random with respect to the thing that you conditioned on. So. You saw this in terms of events before. Yeah. Okay, was that in this class? Yeah, we had the free law of the expectation that we used. We had A instead of Y uh -huh. in the formula. Yeah, uh, this is the law of total expectation, but instead of the events being general events, they're events that correspond to values of another random variable. Uh, so this is the law of total expectation. Since this form has multiple expectations, it's often called the law of iterated expectation. Something that helps me is when I'm working with these, underneath each expectation, I'll put a symbol for what it's averaging over, so then I know that the other thing that's left is still gonna be treated as random. So I'll put a little x under this. So this expectation is averaging over x. Y is still random. So then the outer expectation must be over y. And then you finally get the constant that you want, and that constant is the expected value of x. Uh, for the variance of x, this one's more complicated. But it has a, little, has a little pattern to it. You take the expectation of the conditional variance plus the variance of the conditional expectation. OK, 
Okay, expectation of conditional variance plus variance of conditional expectation. And so in, in, in both of these two terms, the inner part, this first variance, is sort of, variance is an expectation, right? It's averaging over x, y is still random. So then you take the expectation of that function of y. And on the right-hand side, you start with the expectation with respect to x, and then the variance will be an integral or expectation over y. Okay, uh, let's prove them both. Prove A first, and don't write too big. There's, part B is, uh, well, it'll be a lot of work. Okay, so I know that one of the ways I can express the expected value of X is integrating X times the joint density. I believe this is how we defined expectation in the uh, joint context. All right, well, our, our main strategy today has been rewriting the joint as a conditional times a marginal. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to re rearrange a little bit. All the stuff that has an x will be inside my inner integral. And then I pull out the marginal of y. Usually it's very common to pull out to the left. I'm going to pull it out on the right. Well, inside the brackets, it looks like, almost like the expected value of x, but we're not using the marginal x, we're using the conditional density or mass of x with respect to y. So what we actually have here is the expected value of x conditioned on y. Okay, well, this expected value of x given y, that's a function of y. And we've got that function times the density of y being integrated. It's the expected value of that function of y. Expected value of expected value of x given y. So that one's not too bad. Uh, just play around with the integrals a little bit. Are we okay on that one? Okay, so um, I found this really confusing when I was a student. And a lot of times these kind of expressions, I didn't fully understand them and know how to think about them. A good strategy is to always write it in terms of the integrals and make sure things work out there. Because I know I'm pretty comfortable with manipulating integrals. So sometimes there were identities and I would see them written. I'd be like, I'm not exactly sure that's true. Go back and just express each one as an integral. See if you can get them to equal. And eventually you'll become comfortable with these kind of uh, expressions. All right, let's try B. For B, I'm going to try not to write any integrals. I do want us to get practice writing things in terms of these conditional expectations and variances. So I start with the definition of the variance of x. Okay, so nothing new yet. There's an old definition. I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to add zero in the middle in the form minus conditional expectation of x given y plus 
conditional expectation of x given y. So I haven't really changed anything. I'm just going to group things in a certain way. I'm going to group x minus conditional expectation of x given y, and then I'm going to group my last two terms. Okay. So then, uh, inside this expectation, let me foil this out, where I'm going to treat this first difference as like an A, and then the second difference like a B. So A squared plus 2AB plus 2B squared. Okay. So for the first one, I get my first term squared. Now all of this is going to be inside one big expectation on the outside. But expectation is a linear operator. I can distribute it across the sum. I'm going to go ahead and distribute that across that first term that I squared. Okay. All right, plus, then I'm going to get a, uh, like a cross product. I'll get the expected value of 2. I'll go ahead and pull the 2 out now. First term. Uh, second term. All right, and then again, like before, my outer expectation will be distributed, so I'll go ahead and close that off. And now I look at the second term squared. Plus expected value of... Whew. Are these E's and X's and Y's just kind of like blurring together in your vision? Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> There's so many of them. They have no meaning anymore. Uh, so let me deal with these three terms. Let's call them I, II, and III. Hopefully you've got space to deal with the first one on the first page. It's something strange. When I write on this thing, I end up writing left and right too much, but things are more compact up and down. So I, I'm not supposed to have hardly any room at all. I've still got half a page left. Just an odd observation. Okay, so let me get I, the first one on here. For this one, I'm going to apply the law of iterated expectation to this thing. So I'm going to apply part A that we already proved. I've got the expected value of something. I should be able to do another expectation and condition this on something in the inside and get back the same thing. Apply a law of iterated expectation. So one becomes expected value of expected value. The thing that I'm taking the expected value of but condition it on Y and close off the expectations. Okay, so what can I do with this? Well, this, fu this function of x and y that I'm finding the expectation of, 
part of it's already conditioned on y, right? Can you see what would happen if you got something conditioned on y, then you condition on y again? That, that won't change anything, yeah. It's like, uh, you know, what's the, what's the chance I'll have enough money if I've got two quarters in my pocket? And you calculate it. But what if I have two quarters in my pocket? We already did that. We already dealt with that. So the x here has not been conditioned on y. Uh, this will become... Expected value of x given y minus expected value of x given y Okay, and so now I've kind of dealt with this conditioning on both of my terms <sighs> Okay My inner expectation I've got something minus it, the expected value of something squared inside an expected value. Does that make you think of something? Variance. That is variance. It's the variance of x given y. So I've still got that outer expectation. And inside the expectation is variance of x given y. All right, now I will say I'm abusing notation a little bit by having this just x given y kind of freestanding. Um, I really should probably maybe write this part out in integrals and then have this as an expected value of x given y, but it works. It's still true. One of those common convenient abuses of notation. Ready to go on to two? All right, two is the worst one, and then it'll start to come back to Earth. I'll do these on the next page. Don't think so? All right. Okay, that's good. Uh, maybe, maybe it's me. I have, a, I have a harder time with this proof than probably anything else that we do in maths that one, I think. Well, relatively speaking, yeah. Relatively, yeah. So I believe what I'm doing is I'm just copying down statement two, expression two. <laughs> Don't say that. I can't, I can't handle that if it happens. Uh, all right, I'm going to do two things. On this first time, or first term, I'm going to apply the law of iterated expectation. And then for the second part, um, can you see that both of these two expectations, these are constant with respect to x. The first one is still random with respect to y, but at least it's constant with respect to x. So let's say both constant with respect to x, uh, call it c, call it c. Yeah, so probably, again, the, a more rigorous thing to do would not be call it C, but maybe some function of Y. Yeah. But as we're going to find out all we, all we need is that it's constant with respect to X. And then something nice will happen. Okay, so on my first term... If I use the law of iterated expectation, then I introduce another expected value. Uh, let's see, that needs to be a condition on something. 
Yeah, let me still write that after the parentheses. All right, so the C, um, these two expectations, the outermost one will be with respect to Y, the inner one will be with respect to X. So I can't pull the C all the way on the outside, but I can pull it here. I can set it there. All right, and I'm not gonna have to worry about that anymore because if I look at this inner part, expected value of x given y minus something that's constant with respect to x already, expected value of x given y. Can you see that that's zero? Let me write it one more time before I write zero. This expectation comes on to x, but it's conditioned on y. This thing is a constant with respect to that anyway. It stays the same. Oh good, term two goes away. All right, last one. The third one was So in both of terms one and two, we manipulated something by applying the law of iterative expectation. I'm gonna do that again. I'm gonna do it here. So I am keeping my first part the same. And I'm re-expressing expected value of x as expected value of expected value of x given y. <laughs> There's four expectations in this. <laughs> it's obscene. Okay. Um, we know that this is random with respect to y. It's just another random variable. Let's just, just give it a symbol, call it w. And then that same expected value of x given y shows up again. So I've got the expected value of a random variable minus its expectation squared. Did I recognize that a minute ago? It's another variance, it's another variance. Yeah, so W is just kind of a little aid to help us see that it was a variance. Let's not actually call it anything else. Uh, let's see that this is the, ex variance of the expected value of x given y. And I believe we're done now, because in term one, we got the expectation of conditional variance. Two was zero, three is variance of conditional expectation. It's everything we need. Whew. All right, now that is, uh, I think, difficult to prove. It's, it's pretty easy to use a lot of the time, though. And it's, it can be such a huge time-saving shortcut. Let's go back to that first example. You remember how I was finding the expected value by doing kind of a lot of messy calculations, basically enumerating that random variable? Uh, well, let's try doing it this way. If I want the expected value of x, Law of iterated expectation says it's the expected value of the expected value of x given y. Well, we figured out the ex that x given y is uh, geometric. Uh, you know what? I shouldn't write y here because in that problem I already had the, the symbols x and p. 
So let me, let me replace that Y with a P. That makes more sense. Okay, so inside the outer expectation, what's the expected value of a geometric? Yeah, it's 1 over P. Yeah, but the parameter is being treated as random. So instead of writing 1 over little p, I write 1 over capital P. You can't really tell. That's a capital P. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, it's tempting to want to do like one over the expected value of P. That's not true, so don't do that. I've got to go back to taking an integral of this function of P uh, with respect to the density of P. Uh, antiderivative of 1 over P is natural log. So if you remember, the distribution of x was a little bit messy. It probably would have been hard to find its expected value directly, but by using law of total of iterated expectation, uh, three lines. And so let's actually see that. So here, you can see I put the formulas from those, those theorems. Uh, the expected value of x, there's the 1 over b minus a, difference of the natural logs. For this set of parameters, I get 1.98026, 1 1.98026. 1 Very cool. All right, questions on that? Okay, I think we've just got one page and one more example to do. Uh, one page and two more examples, all right. Um, so this next one is in the textbook, it's unlabeled, it's just on page 166 if you wanna find it there. Have you ever worked with a non-central chi-square distribution? This shows up in some hypothesis testing. Okay, uh, probably not. I don't, I don't use them that much. So just off in the margin, if you recall, if I have uh, a bunch of IID normals, and if I define Let's call it W, equal to the sum of the squared normals. It's a chi-square with P minus one degrees of freedom. which is a uh, special case of gamma. So that's something that we had, um, we've seen that when we did gammas and then I think very early in lecture four when we found the distribution of the square of a standard normal. Okay, so what if you make this change? What if these are not standard normals but they're shifted standard normals. They still have unit variance, but they have a, um, a different mean than zero, so they're non-central. And W, which would be the sum of their squares, is a uh, non-central chi-square. So that, that changes the distribution uh, you won't get that special case of the gamma anymore. Let's investigate it. And we're actually going to find another way of expressing it that actually doesn't use normals at all. And maybe at the end I'll be able to relate them. 
Okay, so we will not derive the non-central chi-square density. I'll just give it to you. And this is different. Um, the density is expressed in terms of a sum. So not just a single term like you are used to, but this one, you, you need to sum things in order to express it. X to the, let me make it more clear, this is in an exponent. P over two plus K minus one, that's all in the exponent. E to the negative X over two over the gamma function of P over two plus K, close gamma, two to the P over two plus K times I'll tell you, if you want simple expressions, don't go into stats. Not a good discipline for that. All right, so this is the density, the sum. We want to find the expected value of this. Now that sounds terrible, because I would need to take x, a sum of x times this. I'm going to get a double sum. Oh man, what we're gonna do is we're going to kind of work backwards. We've been starting with hierarchical distributions to get a joint density. Can we look at this joint density and work backwards and see what hierarchical distribution could give this? If we can, if we can figure out this is the result of a hierarchical distribution, uh, then maybe it'll be easier. All right, so when we look at this, can we see um, two different random variables in this? Gamma and a Poisson, you're right. So over here, I'll do the Poisson first. It looks like, um, since I'm using K as the variable, I'm using a capital K to represent a Poisson lambda. And the other one definitely looks like a gamma, um, but not just, not just any gamma. Yeah, now here's something that might help with that. Uh, I'm going to switch to the document cam. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's no help at all. <laughs> do I just do I twist this thing around? Or? You know what? It's big brain time. <laughs> Use the paper. Uh, all right, so look, look here. Um, if you're watching the video, look at the lecture nine notes, page three, example 3.3.11c. Um, this is the definition of a a central and ordinary chi-square with uh, p degrees of freedom. And you'll see how, let's see, inside the gamma you've got p over two, and then a p over two here, and a p over two minus one. Let's try to connect that back to what's on the screen. We see the, the p over two, but then it looks like there's a plus k on it. So it looks like uh, x given k equal to k. Let's see, let me remember first one capital, second one lower. Is distributed k 
chi-square. Um, okay, so the P over 2 actually corresponds to having uh, P degrees of freedom. If I thought of this K as 2K over 2, then I could combine it with the P over 2, and it would be P plus 2K over 2. So my degrees of freedom is actually P plus 2K. All right, so uh, how in the world does this match up with the distribution of the sum of squares of non-central normals? Um, Wikipedia actually has a pretty nice quick brief summary of it. If you work with this density, then you get to a point where you get a hyperbolic cosine. You express that as a Taylor series and you get this uh, sum. In the sum from the Taylor series, you get something that looks really Poisson. You manipulate it. And so we can see that this non-central chi-square is a, a weighted sum of chi-squares where the weights come from a Poisson. Kind of wild. Yeah. All right, but now that we've done this, uh, the rest of the problem will be very easy. We want the expected value of x by the law of iterated expectation. That's the expected value of the expected value of x given my other random variable. In this case, it's k. All right, so uh, what's the expected value of a chi-square? That one has been a while. Did we write that down? Okay, we can get it quickly. A chi-square is a special case of a gamma with alpha equal to p over 2, and then beta, the rate is always 2. Uh, and the expected value is alpha beta. Twos cancel, it's just P. It's whatever the degrees of freedom is. And in this case, the degrees of freedom are P plus 2K. So on the inside, expected value of P plus 2K, still treating K as random for now, Um, expectation of a constant is just a constant, and I can pull the 2 out. K is Poisson lambda. Its expected value is lambda. And there's the answer. Right, so again, we see that's a, a huge time and effort saver. We got 10 minutes left. We've done a lot of examples of this. On this last one, let's see how much you guys can step me through it, okay? So, uh, yeah, I wrote this when my kid was a toddler. She's grown a bit. But her piggy bank was filled with grimy coins covered in Play Doh, fingernail polish, and other filth. Due to the residue covering each, the probability of heads for a randomly selected coin is not just one half, but it follows a beta distribution. General parameters, alpha, beta. I pull out a coin, flip it a fixed number n times, and I set x to be the number of heads. Find the mean and variance of x. What do I do? Um, beta distributions. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, betas are random variables to support between 0 and 1. So they, I would say, are the go-to choice for modeling a random probability. Okay. Uh, the Bayesians do that a lot. Uh, whenever they have a probability that they treat as random, they will almost always model it with a beta. In MathStat 2, we'll find out that there are some nice properties that come from using that. 
since, since this has represented probability, I'm either restricted to uniforms, which I already did, or betas are the other choice. All right, so, uh, I mean, there's a beta distribution in here. What should we call that? Yeah, what's a good symbol for that? What would be reasonable? How about P? Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we think of this as like a chance of success. Uh, so let's say that P, the chance a coin comes up heads, is beta. All right. The there is another random variable, but the name is not given. Can you recognize it from the context? Name looks binomial, isn't it? Looks binomial, yeah. So is it x is binomial or conditionally x is binomial? Conditionally, right? Because if p changes. Yeah. Right, p could change. If, we, if we're able to fix a p, yeah, so let's say x given p is equal to a particular value. This is binomial. It's kind of different. Last time it was the number of trials that was random. This time we're letting that be fixed and it's the chance of success that we're treating as random. This is the same idea where if you don't fix p, it's going to be kind of like a chain geometric where it's not quite binomial, but it looks kind of... Yeah, um, if we don't fix... P, then we can't really say what X is. Yeah. There might be some choice of P where X is also binomial. Maybe X ends up being something totally different. Uh, we're not actually going to know because we're not going to find the distribution of X. We're just going to try to find its mean and variance. I haven't actually taken this one all the way to find the distribution of X to see if it ends up being something nice or not. I have no idea. Yep. Yeah, what's the uh, expected value of a binomial? In P. Except in this case, I. There you go. All right, uh, so then we need the expected value of a beta. Is that one you remember? No. The expected value is not bad, the variance gets a little bit. Yeah. It gets a bit worse. That was when we had that was when we had some trouble with that. It's all absorbed. Oh yeah. yeah. All right, so I mean, we're done with the first part. Yeah. Um, a lot of the last part of this class, we're going to try to move away from like really messy calculations and try to use some higher level theorems to work with these things. You know, it's, it feels like the difference between being a soldier on the battlefield and the general who's commanding the troops. Uh, not completely. We still have some few, a few messy problems left. But whenever you can, you know, try to find something like this to, to make uh, or, or take advantage of relationships between random variables. Okay, so what about the variance? Now, a few weeks back, you walked into my office, and it was right after we had done the generating functions homework where you had to find the variance of a random sum. Mm -hmm. And I said that I was, I, I saw maybe a different way to do it. Yeah. Uh, it. It was this, this relationship. You can verify that same solution 
This, this one's quicker. If you already have access to this formula, this is quicker than the generating functions. But I mean, proving that was a beast. All right. Um, Right? I'll write it as NP1 minus P with capital P's. Uh, and then this last part, this feels a little bit familiar. Uh, we've already got the expected value of, in, of X given P, which is uh, NP. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll pick it up from here. I can pull out the N. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one is, that one is harder to remember. Um, at this point, I'm not going to do all the algebra because we, we are almost out of time. But what I have is basically as long as I know the moments of a beta, I can figure all this out. And I think you did a homework problem that gives you a general form for the moments of a beta. So that's something that's known. We would just have to go and look it up. Use formulas for uh, moments of a beta, which will then give you all of these. And, and you do a, a fair bit of algebra. And you get something, I think all things considered, is not that bad. At least you get a nice, tidy expression, just in terms of alpha, beta, and m. All right, questions on that? Okay, so four homework, uh, three problems. I like this problem. So he's got a walking stick, and his walking stick is so old it's going to break soon. It's going to break at a point uniformly distributed along its length. So it's one meter long, it's going to break at any random location. When it breaks, he will discard the top portion. Whatever's left on the bottom goes to his midget brother. He will use that until it breaks at a point which is uniformly distributed along its length at which point he discards the top portion and then that bottom portion is left. So, what's gonna be left after it breaks at two places? This is hierarchical because first it's gotta break somewhere, but then where it breaks the second time depends on where it broke the first time. So, uh, find the distribution. You'll use the same strategy of get the joint by doing conditional times marginal. Uh, the, the hint that I'll give on this one, watch out for the support. Kind of like where the insect was laying eggs and you can't have more survive into adulthood than there are laid in the first place. Well, the second time it can't break at a place above where it broke the first time. So, their joint support is something you have to keep into account. If you do that, it's not bad. I got stuck on the solution because I was forgetting that and my integral didn't make sense. Um, I would like you to find the mean and variance using the shortcut formulas, then just find the mean 
by, once you get the distribution, by integrating that times x. You'll get an integral that's simple, but it's not something you encounter commonly. If you look up in a table of integrals, I'm fine with that. You'll get the same answer. Uh, two is really easy. Two is really easy. Uh, three is a little bit tricky, so I give hints. Yeah, so I like this one. Uh, you've got, a, got the unit circle. And you're going to randomly point, choose a point inside the circle. Let's say it's here, you call it P. Wherever P is, you then make another circle. And then you pick a point Q inside of that one. Let X be distance from the origin from uh, to P. Let Y be the distance from the origin to Q. Find the joint distribution of X and Y. Again, the support of that's important because Y can't be bigger than X. Y has to be give distance to something inside the first circle. Oh no, I did the last part of that with, uh, oh well. All right, um, questions or comments on anything in this one? <laughs> I never thought about that. I just put part A because I was forgetting the right. Okay, so how much did I miss by not switching that over in the entire last page of the notes? All right, to whoever's watching the video, I apologize. Uh, you can look at this and then hear the, hear the audio and then piece it back together. <laughs>